for Jumping Eagle versus Trump. As you all know, we are suing the United States government, in particular, President Trump himself, as well as the Army, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and Energy Transfer Partners over Standing Rock. What do you, what do you think in terms of uh, the treaty violations? Because uh, according to federal Indian uh, lawyers I've spoken to, this whole pipeline route is actually on Standing Rock Sioux land not just how they navigate, oh, well, this is where the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation is not going to be affected. Can you kind of talk about the treaty right uh, violation? You know, and to speak on the, the treaty aspect, um, the land that the, the Ocheti Shakoi camp was on was on treaty land. The land that the, uh, you know, all of that land there. So we stood on that land. We lived there. And we, and we, we were protecting the water. We were protecting the land because that is our land. We, like Sarah says, we don't forget. We have never forgotten that those are our lands. They belong to us. They belong to our ancestors. They belong to all the generations coming. That we have relatives that bathe their children in that water, that drink that water, that depend solely on that water source. And so we stood there and we lived there and we prayed there in defense of all of that. On, and, and, I, and I, I believe that we should have been allowed legally to remain because those are our treaty lands and then it's our right to stand on treaty lands especially in defense of, of everything that is sacred to us. We were involved in, uh, at the end, you know, we were issued the eviction. A really unfair and unrealistic eviction given the timeline that we had. Uh, we had been making attempts to clean, to, uh, to protect and take care of the land. And uh, it just was impossible uh, to, do, to finish that job in the timeline that they had wanted us to. I have been told, um, I had been told at different times from different strategists that being there in that location was not, that there was nothing we could do. It was not a good strategy. But, but, um, but we didn't feel that way because in our hearts we knew that was where we were supposed to be because those are our treaty lines and it's right there. It's right there in the face of Dapo. It's right there, in the, right there in the face of the construction of that pipeline. And we have the right to be there as descendants of the treaties. Now, how, after everything played out, you know, we, we saw the aggression we, felt we lived through the aggression. We lived through all of the different, the violations of laws on every level. I'm sorry, I, it's still very hard for me. We lived through that, and uh, we went through the eviction as, the, as that process went, happened every day, you know, in the beginning of that negotiation process, we asked the Army Corps of Engineers for an extension on that on that date. And that every day they came back and said no. The whole world called the Army Corps of Engineers and asked for an extension. Every day they came back in the morning for that meeting and they said no. So finally in those last two days they wanted to come in and they wanted to continue the, the cleaning and we said no. You cannot. You, know, you have not given us any honor in this process, so you cannot come in today. We need to have this time to pray together, to be together, to, to honor all of our sacred things that we don't have time to get out of here. The, there, there were sacred things within the camp that were, that were disrespected in their bulldozing after the eviction, during the eviction. So we believe that that was our, our place to stand, to be. We were cleaning, we were wanting to move to higher ground because nobody wants to be in a flood. And we, you know, they, there was all this talk of a flood, but they never brought any science, any facts, any papers stating, you know, any history of, of weather reports, any predictions of, of that there might actually be a flood. There was just talk. And you know, but even considering that, we were still cleaning up and we wanted to move to higher ground, we wanted to hold our ground. 
because that's what we believed and we felt in our hearts. That that is, you know, that's our treaty land. So everything happened and then we were removed. After the fact of being removed, it was acknowledged to me that yes, this was the most powerful place you guys could have been. There are many pipelines that are near Indian lands, that are near sacred sites, but that none are as close as, as close to Treaty Labs as the Dakota Access Pipelines. And we had, they referenced in past tense that we had the strongest point at, in, that, in that land we were at. And so it, it's been really hard to bear that, to bear that knowledge that we knew, we knew that. That's what we were telling the world. That's why we stayed. And then to have it acknowledged after the fact, as in past tense, like we no longer have that, it's, it's not true. That it's, it's not a past tense thing. It's still our land. We still have this, this stance and, you know, maybe we have to come in through a different, different door now. You know, through the laws, through the courts. But, but we're not a people that give up. Even if there's a, there's a loss, as Bruce said, you know, don't lose hope. The power is within all of us collectively. It's in within all of, within all of us individually to, to stand up and to, you know, to keep going until we find the right door mm -hmm. to where we need to be. So throughout, uh, you know, we're resilient and um, we need to continue to hold our hope and to hold our prayer and our belief and keep moving forward. Well, we know that the, um, the area that the Dakota Access Pipeline was being constructed um, and the area where the Ochete Oyate camps are, are all treaty territory, um, 1851 and the 1868 treaties um, guaranteed our Lakota people's um, rights to those lands. And it was not only the land, but the use of the waters, hunting, fishing rights, and our, our right to live there. Um, but during the, uh, the times gradually that the U.S. government decided that it wanted more and more land, it was, it's been gradually chipped away, but there was never a new treaty um, put in place. And so those laws still stand. Um, the other aspect of the, the treaty rights to the area is that um, we, never, um, we never gave up use of those lands. Um, the Cannonball Ranch is actually another area that is, um, should be a, a historic, um, under the Historic Preservation Act as well. We have um, stories in that area of our people um, fleeing the cavalry. Um, we have places there that are sacred and that are often used. Um, so for the government, and especially the state of North Dakota, to allow the um, Energy Transfer Partners and Dakota Access Company to uh, purchase that land without our um, agreement to that. Um, not only to purchase it, but then to use it to contaminate our water is um, so egregious. Um, and of course, the, the government is trying to avoid addressing those issues as far as, because they know that, um, that we're right. And so they want to continue to justify their use of eminent domain, and we've seen that in other areas too. People are fighting in Iowa and Nebraska um, against pipeline, the pipeline as well. Um, so they are gonna continue to, to try to avoid those issues because they have no standing. Um, the, you know, the treaties were negotiated as part of, and I think in America they, like to forget our history, but um, but the Lakota people won a war, and the United States government had to come and negotiate peace with our people, and that was how those treaty boundaries were defined. And so, although the U.S. government and people want to forget that um, those were the negotiations that happened, um, we are we don't forget, and we know that that. That is our land that we live on. So we're working on, um, in this case, really making sure that uh, 
the sacredness is taken into account. I, I was out there and um, I asked why the place was called Cannonball when I first went. And I don't know that this was ever spoken of enough um, in any of the articles I read or, or any of the media, but the reason it's called Cannonball is because of the natural whirlpools that used to form perfectly round stones. And, um, and I apologize because my pronunciation of the language of the Lakota Yate is not, not always perfect, but um, Tunkan is what I was told that these round stones are very sacred and that they can represent many things and they're used as a focal point in ceremony. And I was told they represent um, that, that oneness, that wholeness, the earth, the entire universe and the center of the universe, which is also within each of us. And so that, that stone is a microcosm of everything sacred. And that's the place they form, right there, at Cannonball, at Stanley. Crazy Horse himself wore a Tonkan when he would ride into battle. And he was never wounded in battle. And so these stones, um, they are sacred in and of themselves, but the place that they form is sacred. The water that forms them is sacred. And whereas all water is sacred, all water is life, that place is very special. That place is very significant. And it's already been desecrated other times. First, when there was the wars that, where that land even had to be put under treaty control. Second, when Lake Oahe was formed. And that as well, they were going to put the dam further north. And they decided, oh, that would affect too many non-native ranchers. And so instead they put it on the reservation and a lot of land was lost. A lot of people were forced out of their homes. And now we see it again, where they say, oh, that's a, a very convenient place to reroute. <clears throat> and these aspects are being argued in this case. Uh, we're trying to bring up not just the sacredness of water, but the sacredness of this specific body of water, the sacredness of this specific place, all the burial sites that have been desecrated. Um, all of the all of the sacred sites and the prayer sites that are around us and, and people um, they don't uh, maybe have the experience of always um, relating to a, na a natural place as sacred and that's one problem we do have with the government they always look for structures they always look for proof show us something you built here show us how you changed the natural landscape so that we can understand that you thought it was sacred in its natural form <laughs> and that's a very difficult thing to do and so um working in indian law it itself is many times um a contradiction in worlds and bringing things that maybe they've never even held as sacred or as religion and help them understand that that is what we're protecting them that is what this case is about. It's not just about land rights. It's not just about human rights. It's not just about the honoring of treaties. It's, it's everything. This, this case is very unique in that there is not an area of law that it doesn't touch in some way. And so then the challenge is to take all those pieces and make them a cohesive whole that is understandable in a short fashion to a court on a few sheets of paper. Uh, but we do have experts from around the world, mechanical engineers, water specialists, etc., who people who build these pipelines for a living. And they have parsed them, um, analyzed the, this pipeline quite thoroughly. I don't know if all of you know this already, but the length of pipeline that is being routed under Lake Oahu is 7,500 feet long. It's called Horizontal Directional Drilling, HDD Pipeline. This is by far the longest length of pipeline ever recorded on record. The next closest is 3,000 feet. So this has never been done before. The Army Corps and Energy Transfer Partners, etc., are all claiming that this is a safe route. That's an absolutely ludicrous and unsupportable claim. There are so many problems with this process. Not only is this an unprecedented, unprecedented length of pipeline, there's no way to inspect 
the oil as it's flowing through. So a long, slow, continuous leak is what will happen. Our experts have made it quite clear this is not an if scenario, this is a when. This is a when this will leak. There are three aquifers under Lake Oahe. This water source connects to downstream, there are 17 to 20 million people who will be affected. So this is basically a catastrophe waiting to happen. It's a long, slow, developing ca catastrophe, but that is what, that's the scenario we can realistically predict and that we can really show in court. So not only that, but just to one quick last detail on this pipeline, because it's been such a, a bizarre process. Um, <clears throat> these, the well joints of, of an HD length, HDD length of pipeline are every 40 to 80 feet. Those well joints, by nature, are susceptible. They're vulnerable points for, for this pipeline. The federal government, which is basically a captured party by this industry, only requires that 10% of those well joints are inspected before this HDD length of pipeline goes underground. When it goes underground, it's pulled under Lake Oahe from one side to the other, and it's not inspected afterward. There's no technology in existence that is capable of, of inspecting this pipeline once oil starts flowing. More than that, we have, we have more experts who will testify to, to other sort of shocking scenarios around this. But the point is, this is an extremely reckless pipeline. This is the worst possible route we could have chosen. There are several other possible routes. So at the very least, we have to stop the oil. Even if it starts flowing, we, we intend to stop it. Um, people ask me, so why, if this pipe is going to be buried so deep in the land, how does it affect, you know, the water, and how does it affect your spirituality? And in our Lakota prophecies, there's a prophecy of the black snake, and just the existence of the pipe under the earth, oil or not, the existence of it is a violation of our spiritual ways, because it is literally a rape, a violation of Mother Earth. And they ask, so if it is 100 feet deep, how will it pollute the water? And one thing is that I think this pipe has 187 places where it's welded. And if you can imagine threading anything into the earth that has that many welded spots, and it has to go down, and it has to go around several angles, um, the likelihood that there will be no leaks before oil even flows, it is impossible. And once the oil flows, this toxic tar sand oil, most poisonous kind of oil, will leak down into the earth and they have no technology to detect those leaks and they have certainly no way to repair them. You can imagine this being 100 feet deep. Not only that, but there are aquifers straight down and when that oil leaks into the earth, it would poison those aquifers that affect many other states. So once this oil leaks from the pipelines, we know it goes into the earth, we know it goes into the water, affecting the medicinal plants in the water, affecting the animals that drink the water, affecting our cultural ways of fishing and hunting that are central in our spiritual ways, our cultural ways. It affects everything from there. Our ceremony, so much of our ceremony and spiritual ways involve water and in taking water, the abstinence from water, honoring water as a source of life, not just a resource, a source of life. And so when this oil flows, it, it's affecting all the levels, biologically, culturally, spiritually, in all the ways. There's no way, we know by the other oil spills already how it will affect health. And the oil spills, for example, in Enbridge, we see the dramatic rise in cancer, in terminal illnesses, in deaths, dramatic of the animals, of the people. And so we are doing everything we can do to take a stand for protecting our spiritual ways, but also literally protecting a physical genocide of our people. The relocation that has happened um, on our reservation some years back to infertile lands already has been such a violation of our people and to have the waters flow, it's our only source of water for the Great Sioux Nation. So if you think about your only source of water is poison, how could that not affect everything?
As Tangerine said, I'm acting as the lead attorney. Uh, actually, Red Wolf is an attorney, as you know, and has participated in drafting the complaint. So we've moved to intervene. We have 14 plaintiffs led by uh, Dr. Sarah Jumping Eagle. And to a degree, we've exploited Sarah's name because <coughs> Jumping Eagle v. Trump just has a good cachet to it. Uh, someone created a meme. I don't know if it was done for this case, but there's a meme out there of an eagle at a desk pecking away at Trump's hand, and he jumps away in shock. Um, those are real photos that are obviously joined together, but Trump is jumping away for some reason in the picture, so someone added the eagle. So we now have a jumping eagle on Trump. And, uh, My name is uh, Dr. Sarah Jumping Eagle. I'm Oglala Lakota and Midawaka Twan Dakota. Um, I'm originally from Kyle, South Dakota on the Pine Ridge Reservation, and I currently live on a Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota. Um, and, and I'm a physician, I'm a pediatrician as well, and I've been active in uh, public health and environmental health issues for going on 10 years now, I would say. Um, what it means to me to be a part of this case um, and to be a plaintiff means that um, for us as Lakota people, we are going to continue to demand justice in this world, and we're going to hold those accountable who violate laws and who violate our rights. Um, not only our religious freedom rights, our right to clean water, um, but our right to live on the land and for our children to live on the land in the future as our relatives before us did. And those are uh, the rights and our ways of life that we're going to continue to fight for. As a representative of, of our nations, of our, uh, of our Lakota people, but of all the indigenous people of the world who are, whose lands are suffering the environmental injustices that we're facing, I have looked at the Ocheti Shakoli, Ocheti Oyati camp. Um, it's been referred to as both. But I have lived there with my family, with my mother, with our children. And um, so, so we've seen a lot of things. We've witnessed a lot of hardship, a lot of things that most people in my world question. They say, how, how is that legal? How are they doing that? And I don't have the answer because a lot of it, a lot of the things that we've experienced are not legal. And that they're not okay. So I don't have the answer for the world when they when they say that's not possible because we've lived it, we've seen it. And it and it will continue to go on unless we stand up and we and we put our foots down and we say no more. We want to hold this country accountable. We want to set a precedent so that everyone in the world can hold their governments accountable for the destruction of our lands. My name is Dr. Shawnee Phillips. I'm also of the Minikojo band. My daughters and I are enrolled members of the Shan River Sioux Tribe. And I'm here in part of this. Um, also in my work at home, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm here to see that we bring justice to our people, this environmental racism that's happened that is literally a legal violation of our laws in terms of the environmental impact statement being already in the Federal Register and not being honored by this administration, as well as our treaty rights being violated, our treaty rights to protect our water. And as we know, when DAPL leaks, we know that that toxic tar sand oil will poison our waters, which touches everything and who we are. So literally this will result for us in uh, genocide of sorts and spiritually, culturally, the land, the water, the people. And so I know in my heart every day when I look into my daughter's eyes, I need to be able to tell them that we've done whatever we can do on all the levels, on all the levels. It's a survival mode now to whatever we need to do to stand for this change, to stand for the truth of what really needs to be this paradigm shift. And so when I look into their eyes, I need to be able to say we've done everything we can do to protect our culture, our people, our water. Um, what we've argued is twofold. One, we've taken up the religious issues that the tribes have raised. 
the use of the waters from Lake Oahe and, and the Missouri River complex are fundamental to the Lakota faith. We're also arguing that the army under President Trump illegally reversed the army's position from six weeks earlier under President Obama. Now, what happened last summer was that permits were given by the Army Corps to Dakota Access to build a pipeline in general, but they hadn't yet rendered a decision on the easement to cross under what the Army calls its lands at Lake Oahe. Now, the waters are controlled in large part by the tribal governments who have reserved rights. But these were really treaty lands that were diminished by Congress at various times in the 20th century. So although the Army Corps has title to it, the tribes, all, tri tribes ultimately claim ownership of this. But in terms of the narrower issue we're, facing with, we're faced with right now, in December, the Army Corps issued a whole set of fairly comprehensive findings that not enough study had been given to one alternative routes, no study was given to it by anybody except Dakota Access. The Army rubber stamped its report. And two, the environmental impacts of a leak at this location. And three, the impact on cultural and religious life for the uh, tribal members and their governments at that location. And, and the Army Corps issued extensive findings explaining why more study was needed. Well, President Trump came into office and simply ordered by what he called a presidential memorandum, which is not something I knew existed. He said, I instruct the Secretary of the Army to instruct the Army Corps of Engineers to expedite its review and to end the comment and notice periods. Now, the Army had set February 20th as a date for the public tribal members, governments, anyone to comment on the easement. And President Trump simply ordered the comment period closed on February 7th. And then ordered, I'm sorry, it was a January 23rd when he did this. And ordered the Army Corps to expedite its review. Now, where does the president, no matter who he is, get the power to order an expert agency to expedite its review? Well, he doesn't have that power. You know, imagine a group of engineers are assigned by Congress the task of approving a permit based upon environmental study. And the president, who's a real estate broker, he comes in and he announces, well, I want you, I'm ordering you to expedite that review. You know, I who, you know, build hotels and things of that nature, I can tell you that you don't need more time, I can order you to hurry up your expert analysis. That's precisely what happened. And the Army being the Army just followed President Trump's diktat, so to speak. So the issue we're really challenging here administratively is that the President had no power to do what he did. That's one thing. That's why he, that's why Jumping Eagle is suing Trump because President Trump does not have that authority. Now, the President has a lot of powers, but this is not one of them. And the case law says where there appears to be political coercion on an expert agency, the court has to look very carefully at, what the, at the result of that in, in court. The second point is that even assuming he had the power to expedite that review, which he didn't, the Army Corps simply announced We've concluded our review. We find the original record from before December was fine, and we accept the easement. We don't see any need for further study. Now, although it took about eight pages to say that, literally most of the eight pages was just a listing of all the documents that were earlier in the record. They literally made no findings of fact as to why they now disagreed with themselves from six weeks earlier. Six weeks early, they said, we need more study. They explained why. President Trump comes in, and all of a sudden, well, we don't need any study. The original record was fine, and we don't have to tell you why we think that now. And that's really where we stand. We actually are in that sort of you know, Alice in Wonderland world, 
where you know black is black on December 20th and black now becomes white on January 23rd. And the sky is up one day and it's down the next day and two is three and three is two. We're simply switching around things. And so this is actually a very strong case in my view because administrative agencies have to make findings. They're courts actually. They have to study a case, they hear evidence, they can't cut off the comment period two weeks earlier and prevent our clients here from introducing their comments. And they can't simply rubber stamp a decision without explaining in detail and in substance why they're doing it. Well, that's exactly what has happened here. So that is essentially what this case is about. Congress has plenary power over the affairs of Indian nations, Native American nations. This notion that Congress has this plenary power over Indian nations comes from Two places, and the Supreme Court has said, well, it comes from the Indian Commerce Clause, in which the Constitution says, Congress shall regulate commerce between the states and between the Indian nations and the states. All right, well, the power to regulate commerce doesn't seem to me to come with the power to take half the land of a dependent nation. It doesn't come with the power to take half of New Jersey. And it doesn't seem to me that merely regulating commerce gives rise to the right to steal land so that other people can engage in commerce. You know, yes, it's true that commerce is Red Bull for saying to mine gold on someone else's land. You're in commerce. But does the power to regulate commerce give you the right to steal land from someone so someone else can trade? That principle is wrong. The other place, it comes, the other place where the court says, Congress can disregard treaties with Native American nations is in the treaty clause of the Constitution, where it says Congress can make treaties. And therefore, the reasoning is, well, if Congress can make treaties, Congress can disregard them. <coughs> now, have you ever noticed Vancouver Island? It, it dips down below the 49th parallel. The rest of the US is on the 49th parallel. And Vancouver Island, which is Canada, kind of dips down about three degrees. Go, go look on the map above Washington State one day. Well, we had a treaty with Britain that defined the boundaries of the 49th parallel between Canada and the US, except for Vancouver Island. They wanted all of it, so it dips down below the 49th parallel. Does Congress have the power legally to say, well, we decided the Canadians really aren't using enough of Vancouver Island, and we're gonna take the bottom part of it that sticks down below the 49th parallel, so we can have a nice even boundary, and we can get some of that land, which the Canadians just don't know how to use. Now, obviously, Congress can't do that. And it seems to me the idea that it can do it to Indian nations is equally fallacious. The complaint actually also alleges environmental discrimination. This is an area of law that's not widely litigated, but where a government agency grants a permit to any private developer to engage in any kind of potentially threatening activity of an environmental threat, if it falls unduly the burden on an ethnic or racial minority, and there's no logical explanation for why that location was chosen. One argues that that violates the civil rights laws of the United States. And so here there was initial consideration given to running this pipeline near Bismarck, a mostly white community. And then it was pulled from there with no real analysis except to say, well, there are a lot of streams over there that have to go through. And it was put over here, right where the Sioux communities are based, ex almost exclusively Sioux in, in ethnicity and, and nationality. And any leak is going to burden those communities and their drinking water. And no explanation has been given as to why, in substance, the original route by Bismarck or alternate routes could not have been used. So that's another element of our complaint. And the Obama administration said not enough study was given to this. No study was given to this. Then the Army Corps turns around on the Trump six weeks later and says enough study was given. But doesn't explain why it now disagrees. So that's the essence of the case. I just want to say where we are in the case. The two tribes lost their motion on religious grounds earlier in the week. Judge Boasberg found, in essence, that they haven't shown that their religious practice will be destroyed by the uh, threat to the water or the intrusion to the water area. I think he's wrong because the law says only that there must be a substantial burden 
not a destruction of the religious right. And so I think he's wrong, and probably that can be overturned on appeal. But for the time being, the religious freedom issue seems to have been addressed by the court. It can go further, there can be a trial, but at this point, the judge seems to have addressed that. The next step will be, there's a summary judgment motion pending by the tribes on the administrative law issues, and we will join in with our own brief on those points, addressing basically what I outlined before. Probably by the middle of May, the legal issues will be resolved one way or the other. Now it's possible there might be a trial ultimately on the environmental questions. So even if this oil begins to flow, the case is not over. The oil can flow, we don't want it to, it could start. Judge Boesberg in May, June, July, August can rule in our favor and stop that flow of oil. So don't ever be discouraged because you hear, well, that motion lost, they're gonna start the oil. I'll just tell you one little story. Uh, in Princeton, I've been representing a group of people in New Jersey to stop construction of 15 houses on a part of the Princeton battlefield. That was from the Revolutionary War. And this group said, no, there should be no construction on this land, even though it's privately owned, because the law bars construction that destroys a historic site in New Jersey. Well, this is the Institute for Advanced Study, Einstein's school in Princeton, a fairly wealthy, quite a wealthy institution that wants to build. And my group was a public interest group that stood up. They raised money. They raised about a quarter of a million dollars to hire experts over a period of six or seven years. Well, these plans were filed in 2010. We've been litigating ever since. And not one house has yet been built. And they've now given in and they've agreed to give back three quarters of the field to the public in exchange for some money, but nevertheless. So when we first started this case, we were told, oh, the fix is in, the courts will never pay attention to you because the institute's a powerful institution. And I said, that's nonsense. We litigate because we have the right to litigate. So six years later, seven years later, not one house is built on that site. So don't be discouraged, and we've lost things in that case, and we won things. Don't be discouraged when you hear about a loss. Judge Boesberg is only one judge, and we don't know how he'll handle the other issues. Then there's an appeals court above them, and there is the Supreme Court above them. And in law, you've got to be in it to the end, yes. to know the result. So don't say, oh, we lost, we can't support it anymore, I'm not going to give any money. That's, that's how you lose cases. You've got to stay in it. And because a single loss now doesn't mean anything. And, and by the way, that's the whole history of Indian law in this country. For a long time, Native American groups were abused in law. And then the worm turned. And in the early part of the 20th century, courts started to recognize these rights. And even though there are setbacks today, there's a huge body of law that favors Native American nations. And that's what we use. So don't ever be discouraged when you hear about a, a temporary setback. Comical that the Army Corps, the governor, uh, all the, all the folks of North Dakota and the federal government, they, didn't, they weren't concerned about anybody's safety for months uh, getting brutalized. Suddenly when uh, they, want, they wanted you out for, for their own reasons, oh, it could flood and oh, debris might go into the water. So it was obviously, uh, you know, not genuine. Uh, Bruce, I wanted to ask you two things. One, uh, for the layman who hasn't been attached to this case, what's in it? Isn't it illegal in the first place that they didn't do an environmental impact study? Uh, I know that they, the company kind of fudged it a little bit, making it seem like it wasn't one long pipeline. They made it seem like it was several smaller things connecting. But couldn't that be used, the fact that for an infrastructure project this large, there was not an environmental impact study done? And the second part to that is, uh, how is this case different than the other ones as far as what was illegal? Uh, in terms of the environmental impact study process. Sure, uh, we're the only ones who sued President Trump, uh, and we're the only ones who've made an issue out of the fact that he didn't have the power to do what he did, to order, before you got here I mentioned that the President does not have the power to order an expert agency to expedite or hurry up its review. Presidents just can't do that. Uh, and we've also asked for damages only because we thought that's the way of getting his particular attention. Um, since money is important to the president. Uh, he did own shares, and I think he may still own shares, in Energy Transfer Partners. 
And so that makes it more egregious that he interfered in this process by in order to hurry up the inquiry and to end the comment period. I mean, the president is exceeding his authority, and he does so in favor of a business in which he owns shares. That's fairly egregious personal intervention. And that's why we sue the president personally. And I don't know where that will go, but that's a different issue than the tribes have raised. So that we've added that dimension into the case. You know, the reason no environmental impact statement was done was because the Dakota Access Partners got away with arguing that this was, as you just mentioned, a series of little segments of pipelines that each would stand or could stand independently. Now, this thing is going to run from North Dakota way down to, I guess, St. Louis. I forget exactly where it ends. You know, it's 1,700 miles. And obviously, no one is building this just to bring oil from, say, Cannonball to um, Name a town in North South Dakota. Um, <laughs> oh. Sioux Falls. Sioux Falls. No one's bringing, making this pipeline just to truck oil from Cannonball to Sioux Falls and say, well, we built a separate pipeline from Cannonball to Sioux Falls. But that's exactly what the Dakota Access got away with. They convinced the Army that, well, because each section could be a beginning and an end of a separate pipeline, we don't really need to do an environmental impact statement because no one segment is long enough to justify it under the law. So by this fiction that they're not building one long pipeline, but they're building little pipelines that by coincidence will all communicate with each other, they got away without the required environmental impact statement. And this is one of the things that the Army Corps looked at and said in December, you know, we need more study as to whether it's appropriate to have avoided that test. You know, this is one of those reasons people go to law school at times, so they can come up with rationalizations to help their client. And, you know, the Dakota Access lawyers deserve credit for coming up with this deceptive scheme and in, in manipulating the environmental laws of the United States. But it is a manipulation. I mean, it's, it makes no more sense than to say a worm is 20 separate segments. And that, you know, each one can crawl around on its own. Or a snake. Or a snake. Uh, right. I mean, you don't chop a snake in 20 pieces and say, look at the 20 pieces. It's one cohesive unit. It's intended to bring oil from the north to the south. And obviously this was a deception. So that's how they got away with it. And the Trump administration has offered no explanation. And you can look at the papers yourselves as to why they now changed their view from six weeks earlier. And, you know, what, what lawyers do is they'll, they'll write up a finding, that a piece of paper, right, eight, nine pages, that looks like it says a lot. And in reality, it says very little. And most of it's just a listing of every document that was filed a year earlier. And then at the end, they say, we've reviewed this and find that the record was good enough, but they don't explain why. And literally, you go through eight pages of densely written material to find no explanation of what the Army Corps did as to why they did it. Um, on February 3rd and February 7th of this month. Pulled back from the Department of the Interior, which basically indeed said that not only was the environmental impact statement critical and necessary, but that probably they were, um, that are, there's legal reason to not allow this pipeline to exist. I was wondering if you could speak to that. And, and also to the, um, to the inaccurate data that was used um, in terms of the disadvantaged populations that they evaluated surrounding the Bismarck area and what they used outside the reservation area rather than reservation data that um, they based it on that to make the decision, so effectively doctoring the documents. Report on um, differential burdens on the Native American community versus the white community in Bismarck was conducted solely by Dakota Access Pipeline. Now that's legal. Developers present reports of their views. But the government's not supposed to just stamp it and rubber stamp it. They're supposed to do some independent analysis. There's absolutely no analysis in the record by the government. Um, uh, Shawnee, your other point was the, uh, oh, the solicitor's report. The Interior Department solicitor, who is the chief lawyer for the Interior Department, 
in December, issued on December 3rd, a very, very detailed analysis as to why an environmental impact statement should have been done and was most likely required. And the solicitor concluded that there was a failure to, it doesn't matter, it's not working, that there was a failure to meet the law in terms of the required environmental impact statement. And this synthetic idea that we can chop the snake in 20 pieces and we have 20 little snakes instead of one large snake, the solicitor said, did not justify ignoring the environmental impact standard uh, uh, study. And so the, in, in, what Shani is driving at is that the solicitor, highest legal authority in the Interior Department, came in with a very detailed analysis. The Trump administration said we disagree, but it did not explain why. And so we're in a situation where a detailed analysis by a government agency is ignored in favor of an order by the president to end the inquiry. And I want to add one more thing, and this is the point I was, had forgotten before. The Army Corps in February, February 3rd and 7th, in its reversal of the Obama administration's position said, in addition to the fact that we think the record's okay without explaining why, added, and President Trump told us to expedite the review, so we have. So basically, they simply followed the president's order and reversed their prior findings. Where they can see what does it really mean to honor a treaty and try to come at it from that angle. Well, it's interesting because international law does address protectors. Now, an Indian nation is defined in US law as a dependent sovereign nation. It sounds a lot like a protectorate. And, you know, in international law, a protecting power has a duty to protect the nation it's protecting. It can't just take its land and resources for its own use. It's got to use it for the benefit of the nation it's protecting. So when Red Wolf talks about the US, you know, diminishing a tribal area to give it to some mining company, that's really not what a protecting nation is supposed to do. So there is a place for international law to be used to explain and explicate whether the US is doing the right things. Uh, so there's a role for that in a case like this, in any kind of case involving Native American rights. Um, and so one of the issues that's not really been discussed recently, and this can give rise to it in this case, is you know, does the US really have the right to take Native American lands? as we've accepted over the years? Or does international law say they've got to protect those lands and not intrude on them? So there's a role for international law in, in all of these discussions. The, the sacred aspect, it's hard to bring that into, um, into alignment with the way things are done in the government. And cases like this uh, illustrate that point very well. Um, the difference between the cultures and, and what, what they see as valuable. Recently, um, I don't know who had the chance to attend the, uh, there was a prayer service at the National Cathedral, and there was a point made there that uh, was very poignant, and it asked everyone there to imagine what they would do if it was determined that it would be expedient to run an oil pipeline right through that cathedral. <coughs> And until people have that sort of personal understanding, a metaphor that makes sense in, in what is sacred to them, what their experience is to them, they don't fully always understand the scope of what's happening out there. We're trying to do that for the courts, and we're trying to do that in a way that meets uh, both <coughs> their understanding of what sacredness is to the people of the land where this is happening, but also is um, couched in an argument that they can take action on. Something that is backed up by, um, by law, uh, which unfortunately tribes right now, um, until they are not domestic dependent nations, are working within um, courts of law that were designed by another culture. And that's always the struggle here, is to take one culture's understanding of a world view and to make an argument that another culture will understand and take action on. 
My name is Wash Dewey Young, and I am from Standing Rock in North and South Dakota. I grew up, I was born in North Dakota, and I grew up on Standing Rock, and for the past six months, we've been camped at the confluence of the Cannonball River and the Missouri River, and so my family was out there. Um, Previous to that, I work as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe um, from 2003 to 2015. In that capacity, I testified before the South Dakota Public Utilities Commission three years ago uh, against the Dakota Access Pipeline and um, on the basis that they did not consult, the Army Corps of Engineers did not consult with the tribe and um, basically they had construction up and running in various states before any permits were issued and that was three years ago. So um, after that job, I, was, I felt like I was able to free, freely voice my concerns as a, as a mother and as a citizen of Standing Rock and be able to um, stand up, and that's what we've been doing. And I'm so glad for this experience, and I'm glad to be able to be part of this case because of the environmental injustice that is occurring, the desecration of our sacred sites and our graves and our homelands, and ultimately, when it does leak, uh, that will affect our primary drinking our water source for Standing Rock. So that's why I um, am happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Creator. Thank you, Mother Earth. Thank you for all of the people gathered here. We come before you this day seeking your guidance. We pray that you will help us to see clear as the eagle, walk pure and strong, see, see clearly what must be done, have the strength, courage, and wisdom to do so in a good way. Creator, we know that you have established natural laws, and we know that we have established our own, and we know that sometimes those laws come in conflict. So we pray that you will guide us as to how to bring those back into balance. We know that all the, the pollutions, the troubles in the world, that those are a reflection of our own imbalance and our own pollution in our own minds. We pray that you will help us to learn how to bring that clarity and that, that clean water into the courts where for so long people have been used to the dirty water that we've been given. As we bring that clean water in and help it cleanse things, we pray that the natural law can help the human law come into balance and into, into justice, in, into a way that can actually respect the rights of people, the rights of the land, the rights of the water. And we pray that you help us to carry this with us wherever we may go. We know that the, the sparks of the sacred fire, as we were told by the elders, our looking horse, and the many others who came out and would speak to the people, the, the youth council, the women elders, as they would guide us and said that those sparks would land in our hearts and be carried around the world to light new fires. So as we move forward and, and we're in this battle for our clean water, it's really a battle for our future as humans to be able to continue to live with the earth. And so we, we pray, Creator, to you and, and to Mother Earth that you will help us so that we can come back into balance with you and continue um, to be here as human people, um, that our children and the seven generations to come may also be able to live in this way and, and in these natural laws. So today we ask for this. I'm going to share a song. We use this song for journeys, and this is going to be a journey. And so we pray that we give each other strength on this, and Creator Mother Earth, that you give us strength so that as we travel on this, wherever we're um, struggling along the way, and any time that we might lose our path, that we always be able to feel you under us and feel you above us, 
and feel that spark within us to keep finding that way forward. In something that probably a lot of us have said and felt and seen of late and I know Red Wolf mentioned this co convergence of different worlds and here here we are we're a convergence of very very different worlds and I know there's been a sense of hope and a sense of hopelessness the sense of you know we might succeed and great failure these are very very troubling and scary times that said, as I described before we started this panel, Revolution Truth came together because we believe in people power. We are all volunteer. We're from all over the world, from very, very different backgrounds and walks of life. I mean, wildly different. And yet, we are all here. We are all being changed by Standing Rock, by these women, by all of our plaintiffs. And as I stand, as we sit here before you, I know every one of us feels that this is totally possible. We can do this. We have to stick together for the long haul. You can go to uh, revolutiontruth.org and uh, we have a PayPal fundraiser. We do rely entirely on public funds. And you can also go to Stop Dapple, Stop Trump on GoFundMe. 100% of these funds go to funding this case and making sure we get our plaintiffs to court, etc. So we, are, we appreciate every dollar. Thank you, thank you very much. We also take more volunteers. So. I would also ask people to look at um, ACLU North Dakota. There's been many uh, human rights and civil rights violations, and we've been living in occupied territory for quite some time now. Um, and also to contact your um, your leadership in your state and ask them what they're doing about this.